I'm movie man Eric Houston. Welcome to another look at the vital industrial and educational film shorts of yesteryear. This time, we're taking a look at that cornerstone of the American morning, coffee. We'll start with a somewhat naive and, shall we say, biased look at the story of coffee bean farming and production, produced by the William J. Gans Company and the A&P, yes, the grocery store. It's time for coffee. <laughs> We Americans know what we like, and we really do like coffee. Did I say like? Well, we use more than three billion pounds of coffee every year. Where does it all come from? Mostly from South America. So let's fly down and get the story firsthand. There's a typical plantation now. Many of the remote villages depend upon the plantations for their existence. Life is pretty much the same as it has been for generations. Today, of course, each village has its own schoolhouse, and the standard of living is immeasurably higher with increased knowledge. Naturally, the education of its youngsters includes learning all about coffee at an early age. They learn that coffee begins with a little plant or tree. These trees thrive best in rich red soil. When transplanted from the nursery, they're about two years old. Set in shallow holes, eight to 14 feet apart, the tree must grow for another two or three years before bearing its first crop. Brazil alone has more than a million square miles of coffee country, an area larger than all the United States east of the Mississippi. This is a coffee blossom. Eight to nine months after this blooming, the coffee fruit ripens and looks very much like a cherry. Picked by skilled workers who know just when the ripe berry should be plucked, the average tree bears enough coffee beans to make about one pound of roasted coffee a year. Each plantation has its assembly points, where the day's pick is brought in to be weighed and bagged. This is just one step in more than 24 major operations required in bringing your cup of coffee to the table. The berries must go through a crushing and washing process which takes place on the plantation. Crushing removes the protective red covering with which nature has enclosed each coffee bean. Then they are washed. The beans float while skin or pulp sinks to the bottom. Providing adequate water facilities on a tropical plantation is a necessary and costly requisite in producing high quality coffee.
Now encased only in its final hull, or parchment, the coffee beans are spread out to dry in the sun. This takes from eight to 10 days. Men must rake and turn the beans so that they all will dry evenly. Then packed in bags, the dried green coffee is ready to be sent into the city. Here it is unloaded at a warehouse where it will be inspected, sorted, and graded for quality. This initial grading is one of the most important operations in the selection of coffee. Today, mechanical methods are so perfected that coffee is sorted by machines with great precision. Each bag, after it is stamped with its country of origin, name, grade, and destination, is ready to go to the seaport, where final tests are made before shipment to the United States. Using an instrument like an apple corer, a checker stabs each bag and withdraws a sample for testing. The A&P has its own coffee experts right on the spot to test and grade the contents of each bag to see that it meets the company's quality standards. Samples are flown to the United States together with the experts' appraisals of grade and value. Testing also includes roasting samples of the green coffee and actually taste testing it for strength and flavor. Today, many of the great cities of Latin America have been built largely upon the business of exporting coffee, which is one of their most valuable commodities. The people are modern, up-to-date, and eager to trade with their good neighbors to the north. When the coffee crop is good, business is good, for coffee means the same to these people and their ability to buy the things they need as wheat to a farmer in Nebraska or corn to Iowa and Kansas. While its miles of beautiful beaches and modern cities lure thousands of people to Latin America, nothing intrigues the tourist more than a visit to the waterfront to watch the ships loading coffee for shipment to the United States.
Now a cargo of coffee is loaded aboard ship with the same care you'd use in storing food in your home. You know some foods must be kept dry. A sudden drop in temperature upon leaving the tropics could cause dampness in the ship's hold. This moisture could injure the coffee unless the beans are carefully stowed. So loading a cargo of coffee is also an important operation in getting this beverage on its way to you. New York, New Orleans, and San Francisco are the principal ports through which coffee arrives in the United States. Here, licensed graders spear each bag for fresh samples and taste test the shipment to make certain the coffee they've bought compares with the reports and samples from South America. Based upon the findings of these experts, one coffee is mixed in the blending machine with another to produce the bouquet, the aroma, the flavor desired. From blending machines, the green coffee is introduced next to huge automatically controlled roasting ovens hundreds of pounds at a time. Done to a turn, cascades of precisely roasted beans are released at just the right moment, ready to be freshly sealed into packages the very same day. In this way, you know the coffee you buy is fresh and ready to be custom ground just right for the way you make coffee. Yes, we North Americans really do like coffee. We drink around 120 billion cups a year. After all, drinking coffee is one of life's pleasures, a pleasure that cannot be duplicated by any other beverage. Despite the glossy, cheery attitude of the film, the backbreaking labor of the farmers really does come into focus in this. So much so that the famously cheap price of a cup of coffee really does seem a little troubling. Even given the vintage of this film, I'd say sometime in the 30s, it's kind of hard to believe the filmmakers could keep a straight face when transitioning from the arduous, sweaty labor of the farmers to the crisp, white shirts of the Americans evaluating the beans and sipping their spoonfuls of coffee from those giant, lazy Susans. Now, let's leave coffee growing behind and switch gears to coffee brewing. And believe you me, however you've been making your coffee, you haven't been doing it with even half of the intensity and unyielding detail of this next film. From Vision Associates and the Coffee Brewing Institute, this is coffee.
Our story begins here, with coffee. Its flavor caught in the closed fist of the bean, freed then by the grinding mills in an endless cascade, brewed into a beverage that is consumed in the hundreds of millions of cupfuls each day. In this beverage that has become so much a part of our lives, there is a background, a tradition that reaches deeply into the culture of many lands. Its beginning under warm tropical sun, the care and attention to which it is treated during its journey from tree to cup. The many processes it must undergo are all devoted to creating good coffee with its secrets of aroma and body and taste to which the talents of millions of men are devoted during their lifetime. To which tradition, rich in the lore of centuries and faraway places, sets its fine hand to bring these three elements into precise flavor. The tastes of fine coffee extend over a wide range. But for each palate, there is a flavor that is just right. Around the world, they drink this beverage in its many exotic forms. A dream of Paris, expressed in cafe au lait, a continental favorite, half coffee and half hot milk. Canals of Venice and the romance of cappuccino, like cafe au lait, but topped with whipped cream and a sprinkle of grated orange peel. The music of old Vienna in a cup. Viennese coffee, often spiced, but always with a drift of whipped cream. History of Istanbul and the Eastern lands in Turkish coffee, foam hiding the rich sweet brew. The vigor of Latin American coffees, dark and zesty, served black in tiny cups with plenty of sugar. But always it is coffee. How then do we make the perfect cup of coffee to our taste? Success lies in a single word, care. Three simple ingredients go into the brewing process. Water, coffee, time. Care will produce a perfect result every time. The beginning is the coffee pot, and there are as many varieties and types as taste will dictate, yet, each is intended to do the same thing in a different way, to produce perfection in a coffee cup. To make a good cup of coffee, your coffee maker must be clean, free from all remembrances of that last pot of coffee, ready to begin its work anew, fresh and really clean. Water. Into a hundred thousand pots an hour, water flows in the coffee making process. Water. Too much or too little? Boiled first or later or not at all? For how long? And yet, there is only one correct way. Water, the first element carefully measured, clean and cold. Three quarters of a measuring cup for each cup of coffee, then brought to a full boil. Coffee, fresh. And again, questions. What grind? Percolator, drip, or fine? How much? Coffee. 
the second element. Your favorite blend, the proper grind for your coffee maker, one level CBI measure per cup. This, found in many homes, is the same as this, a Coffee Brewing Institute approved measure. So whether you use one or the other, the measurement will be the same and it will be accurate. The boiling water now passes over the coffee and the brewing process begins. The flame is lowered and, well, watch. The third element is time and it too must be measured accurately. The minutes counted. The flavor will emerge as the process continues. The taste of coffee heightens and increases until all that is good has been extracted. In this method of brewing, percolator, six to eight minutes over gentle heat, and then the liquid is coffee. From these grounds, there remains nothing more to gain but bitterness. No amount of cooking can extract another ounce of good taste, not another iota of good flavor. In the drip method, the coffee is measured and placed in the pot. The water, carefully pre-measured and brought to a full boil, is poured, still boiling, over the coffee. The time? It should take only four to six minutes. In the vacuum method, the coffee is carefully measured into the top bowl. The water is brought to a full boil before the brewing process is allowed to begin. The time, not more than three minutes after the water and coffee are in contact. gently during the brewing process and lower the heat. That's all there is. Like all good secrets, its simplicity is its magic. of coffee has now been captured in a cup. It has substance, a body to go with its aroma and its taste. When prepared this way, it will be perfect every time. Three magic ingredients. Water, fresh and carefully measured. Coffee, the proper grind and carefully measured. Time, carefully measured. A simple recipe for perfect coffee. Perfect coffee, sending its glow into our lives around the clock. It helps us start the day with warmth and vigor.
doesn't spur to the morning's work. It provides the essential part of our pause at noon, indispensable during that unhurried hour in a world that often forgets to stop. In the romance of evening, when young dreams glow softly, coffee is always a perfect companion. And after dinner, it is at home in any setting when good taste is important. In the end, it remains a simple thing, easy to attain, well made and well enjoyed. A good cup of good coffee. As I mentioned at the start, this film was the product of the Coffee Brewing Institute, which sounds like one of those made-up organizations that conducted some poll they mentioned on morning news. But the Coffee Brewing Institute was indeed a real thing. Founded in 1953 by a consortium of coffee-producing Latin American countries, the Institute, under the direction of chemist Dr. Earl Lockhart, conducted all sorts of coffee-related tests. They supposedly created devices to somehow scientifically measure a well-brewed cup of coffee and conducted tests to see if one company's grounds could produce more cups than another. After a name change to the Coffee Brewing Center in 1963, the whole thing was shut down in 1975. You see, the Latin American backers felt that the existence of, and this is true, the International Coffee Organization superseded their coffee brewing center and that the work of the CBC was better done by an international body. But I've kept you from making your own cup of joe for long enough. I'll let you get back to your water, coffee, and time, and I'll see you next time with another look at America's ephemeral film past. Until then, stay safe, watch movies. <laughs>